Welcome to the JD Power Power Seat here at uh, Auto Revolution. Uh, special guest Steve Wozniak, co-founder of Apple. Steve, welcome. Well, it's great to be here. Great to be recognized. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. Well, it, and I'm sure it is sometimes to, uh, great to be recognized, maybe sometimes not to be recognized everywhere you go, but uh, how do you deal with that celebrity? I'm just curious, right off the, right off the start. Um, I don't mind it because everywhere I go in the world, when people come up, can I have a picture? Can I shake your hand, this and that? Can I have an autograph? But it's like they're honoring me. All I have to do is smile, right? <laughs> so I don't, I don't get upset unless I'm looking. I'm trying to find something right now. I'm trying to find my way through this airport that I've never been in. Uh, then please, please let me do my thing first. Yeah. Well, great. Uh, here at Auto Revolution, uh, I know you talked uh, today about your thoughts on uh, automated vehicles, the technology that's more and more technology going into cars. I'm curious, how does the, the prospect of a future of automated vehicles, connected cars, uh, how does that compare to when you were developing the personal computer? Do you, do you see, is it more difficult? Is it more scary, do you think, what the, what the future might hold? Well, it's more difficult, but it's not that good a comparison because with the computers, it was like we were at least in control of a machine that isn't connected to anything. Okay. Up till then, it was really expensive. You had to have a, a mainframe that no human being could afford, only companies, and expensive wires, and pay for the, for the cabling and the, the rates, and connect them to small terminals that were remote. No, we didn't have that. So we didn't have anything like today's internet, which is connected. Now, connected cars could also be connected to each other. I'm connected to mm -hmm. all the cars nearby, and I can tell where they are, what direction they're heading, what speed, and make judgments based on that. I think that's a good one I'm looking forward to, but that's a different kind of connection. Cars connected to, yeah, I can pull this up here right now and honk the horn on my car and shock my wife. <laughs> um, so, uh, I mean, but no, it is kind of nice. I can even open the door, I can start the car, so I'm not lost. If, mm -hmm. um, and so there's some benefits. I think there are huge benefits coming, even in knowing your your driving styles and looking over the masses of people, what are the averages, and, and it might help set some safer streets, safer speed limits, some of those sort of things. Um, I just disagree with the fact that it's not transparent. Mm -hmm. You don't know where all your driving data, every time you did the steering wheel, at what speed you drove every single street, this and that. It's all going somewhere. You don't know a thing. You don't have a clue. Yeah, all that that auto, that data that the car collects, it's like, you know, who owns it for one? Okay. Who, who should have access well, and, to it? And look at two? this. Look at this. The early Teslas are really failing hard, bricked, because one of the chips that holds all the data, including your odometer, was getting written to too many times for all the processes going on. The logging was going to that one chip, and it can't store data that many times. So, uh, so that's, that's an example of how much data could there be that you could use up a f flash memory chip. They don't go out and, in you know, our, our solid state disks and things like that mm -hmm. at that rate. So there must be huge amounts. What is it? What's being collected? Where's it going? I want to, you know, I, I really like things open and they aren't. Yeah. Um, when you were developing products or new technology at Apple, how important was the concept of customer satisfaction? Oh, well, when, when we started, we were very small. You're very tiny. You know almost every customer. They call you and you talk to them, and it's very easy. Um, and they're, they're close people to you. All we ever thought about with our products was how do you make something that's less like a computer in a technical world and more like something familiar in a human world. We started with a typewriter paradigm, and everyone saw that that was the way to make personal computers. It was sort of a familiar device, so, mm -hmm. and that's thinking of the end user. Obviously, one of the big steps we went to was with a mouse-based computer, and we got in too early when it was way too expensive, but it was the whole idea that a human sees the world in two dimensions. You point at a book over there, you point at your nose, and you could point at things on a screen, remote control with a mouse, not with your finger yet, but that was, it's the user input. How does the user put input into a computer, and how do they get it out? We went from televisions to these small, lightweight LCD panels that are so inexpensive now. I mean, these are huge changes. But we at Apple always tried to be a leader in thinking, what, how are we going to make the experience for the user so satisfying that they don't run into problems? So, but you you can't be 100%. You took customer feedback, though, after you developed your first products. And, okay, you take that customer feedback and, and say, okay, how can we take this and use it in the next developed product? Well, in the early days, there's something better than that. Okay. If you make a product for yourself, 
and you have a real good idea. It had better be usable, attractive, something that's not going to bother people. That's caring about the end user in a better way. You are the end user. Mm -hmm. And that was true of me and my Apple II. Steve Jobs getting every little detail on the iPhone right. So he was a non-technical person, but it wouldn't be complicated the way engineers like to make them. And it would just be simple and easy to use and elegant and look good too. And then there was Elon Musk with the Tesla. Okay, who? what engineer would ever build a large electric car? The, the Tesla Model S right. was a larger. No, you'd always come up with the calculations. No, we're going to build one to keep the batteries down cl closer to what a gas car costs. To keep the batteries small, we'll just let you drive 20 miles on the battery. Or we'll let you drive 40 miles. They started out with that small thinking. Here comes a Tesla and it can drive 300 miles, you know, and close to 300 miles. Who would ever make a big one? Well, Elon Musk had a big family. Had built had to build, be, build a big sedan for five kids. Mm -hmm. So he built that for himself. Not to mention the superchargers is the other, the secondary most important part of that company. The supercharger network it basically replaces the lack of gas stations. The power source. Yes, and they yeah. were going to build it up. They were going to build the network. No, the network of superchargers was going to build up over seven years to today. It's everywhere in the United States. Anywhere you want to go, mm -hmm. no problem going there. It started out, though, with only six superchargers between Elon Musk's home in Southern California and up to the factory in Northern California, <laughs> something he knew very well. Uh -huh. So he was building something he would like as his own product, and it turned out that it, enough, enough other people felt that way, too, that we've, we've really got the, the world going in a big electric direction. Entertainment and things you enjoy in life should be a big part of it because it's not important how accomplished you are how much money you made, and how many companies you controlled. It's important how much you smiled in your life and how little you frowned. So smiling a lot, do the things you love, jokes, pranks, and music, driving, sharing stories with your wife, the family, things, and don't frown at things when they go wrong. Just figure a constructive path. Except when things go wrong in technology, I do get upset these days because <laughs> people like me could have made it better and it didn't. And not only that, something that's working okay, they change where things are on the screen. You can't find it anymore. No, I don't like that part of the world. Yeah. But, you know, I, and I go back. I, I go back many generations, so I have still a lot of old school things I like. I'd rather, rather than the social web, I'll just use old school email and, you know, and I gave up newspapers almost the last of anybody. <laughs> gave up analog cell phones much after other people were using digitals. Uh, had my reasons, had my reasons. Yeah. Well, Steve, you make a lot of people smile, and uh, I think that's a great a great thing to, to have in your life, too, is that not just to smile, but to make people yeah. smile. And when you're doing work, you have to get your work done. That's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. But you should have ways to laugh and joke with your, your the people around you and to have a lot of fun playing a game when you take a break, whatever. Come home at night and, and watch your favorite TV shows or sports. You've got to keep a lot of that entertainment in life, along with the work. Hallelujah. Thanks. Steve Wozniak, thank you very much for being here today with us.